A very, very warm welcome to you this morning, everybody. Um, the sun may not be shining, but it's good for the garden. So don't worry, it's coming back tomorrow or the next day. We are safe. But there are a couple of things I just need to say to you before we start, and a little bit of housekeeping. I don't need to tell you where the loos are because we're soon to be back in that situation, aren't we, where you need to know whether there's a fire drill or not. But we are recording this. So if you're not too happy about having your camera on, uh, we totally understand if you want to turn your camera off, but this will go onto our YouTube channel so that people can watch it at a later time, which is always useful to them. Uh, and also uh, there is going to be the opportunity for some questions. We've built in some time for questions. But equally, you might prefer to put that into the chat and then I will more, be more than happy to field that question on your behalf. Absolutely no problem at all. Or, of course, as we've all learned now, there are buttons on Zoom and you can put your hand up and we can go through it that way. So it's entirely up to you. So as I said, this is a, a huge warm welcome to you to the HR Forum this morning. Uh, the Chambers HR Forum is in association with our very valued patron, Hewitt Recruitment, and we meet five or six times a year. Um, and the forum really represents everything that the chamber does. All of you in your roles, in your various companies and organizations, we are there to connect and to support people with any requirement that they might have. Now that in the chamber world, that be, could be across all sectors and all fa factors of business. But of course, in your industry, in your profession, it's very much perhaps some of those things which are dealing with our people and everything that might be affecting them. I have got a number of things which I need to announce as far as sort of parish notices is, is concerned, but rather than do them one by one, because the time is precious this morning, I'm gonna put those in the chat. It's gonna be a link to our events page, and then it's gonna be um, just a couple of details about four particular events which are coming up next month in May. I can say next month now, can you believe it's May next month? But equally, you might find that they're gonna be useful for you or for your team. So look out in the chat box, uh, when I put those in there. And um, so with no further ado, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass you over to Laura Hewitt from Hewitt Recruitment, and uh, she's going to make some opening remarks and then come back to me so I can introduce our speakers. Over to you, Laura. Okay, thanks, Robert. Good morning. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Laura Hewitt uh, from Hewitt Recruitment. Um, it's really great to see so many people today. Um, it looks like record numbers to me. I don't know whether everyone's uh, been feeling the same as me that we haven't had our Sally fix for a while. Um, she always draws a crowd. <laughs> so um, looking forward to hearing from Sally and also from Judy. I'm really interested in um, the, uh, the subject that you're talking on today. Um, I'm really looking forward, as, uh, as Robert just said, to getting back to in-person meetings, but I'm really grateful this week that it's remote because I've got my little boy, a six-year-old at home with me poorly today. So it would have been a cancellation for me, but um, so I'm, I'm grateful to be able to still attend. Um, so I won't speak for long because obviously I'll get interrupted in a minute and I'll have to switch my camera off and sort them out. Um, but just suffice to say that um, we're really seeing a great bounce back in the recruitment market. Um, lots of demand coming back, which is so good to see because we always feel like um, the recruitment industry is kind of quite a good barometer for what's going on in the economy. Um, so it's looking really positive. The skill shortage is back in full swing. Um, we're still seeing quite a bit of reticence from candidates to move into new jobs at the moment because there's still quite a bit of uncertainty. So I think that's exasperating things a little bit, but all looking positive. Um, I won't go on any further, um, but if anyone wants any more information on what's going on in the labour market, please do just get in touch with me, um, you know, outside of this. Um, so I'll hand over to Sally. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, Laura. That's fantastic. So it is very good to hear that there's some positivity out there. We love a bit of positivity. And uh, another link which I will put in the chat is to our quarterly economic survey, which we had an event yesterday to launch that. And while there are concerns, there is a degree of optimism. So that is good. And uh, we can build on that. So what I'm going to do now, because HR professionals, you are facing challenges in an ever-changing world, aren't you? And it's been a challenging year that we've just had, but equally, uh, the next couple of weeks and months and the year ahead will have other challenges and other questions that perhaps our teams are asking. So I am gonna hand over now to, to Sally, Sally Morris, who's a partner and head of employment at another of our patrons, a very valued patron at MFG Solicitors. And she's gonna talk us through everything around COVID, vaccinations, return to work, and that sort of thing. So Sally. Over to you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. I hope you're all well. 
Um, I've got a lot to get through. You all know that I do love to talk and you can't really shut me up. So I'm going to get straight into it. Just to say, though, um, I'm going to share this presentation with you after the seminar and the full notes on it, actually, so that you can take it away, you can digest it and use it as you need it in your business. But I'm going to run through, as Robert has said, the employment implications of vaccination. So as we know, the rollout of the uh, programme for COVID vaccination is fully in swing. And as a result of that, it creates the opportunity now for employers to start thinking about returning employees to the workplace that perhaps weren't in, uh, perhaps have been at home or working uh, remotely. This, of course, raises a number of legal issues because it is not mandatory for people to be vaccinated in the UK. So the government uh, has issued guidance uh, that those that should receive the vaccine are adults living or working in a care home for the elderly, frontline healthcare workers, frontline social care workers, carers working in domiciliary care, looking after older adults. Currently, anybody who's aged 42 and above, and we know that that's going to be extended downwards to the uh, younger age groups as we go through the programme. Um, younger adults with long term clinical conditions and those in the clinically extremely vulnerable group. Um, however, those in the clinically, clinically extremely vulnerable group may not be suitable for the vaccine. And of course, we've seen the government's instruction to shield up to the 31st of March now ceasing. So there is an issue with those that aren't now entitled to, uh, to shield and who may therefore need to come back to work, but who may not be suitable for the vaccine. So where the vaccine is not suitable uh, is also a group of people such as those that are pregnant or breastfeeding, those with any sort of immunosuppression order, um, and possibly those um, suffering from long COVID. Um, the government identified those as a group of people that potentially may not be suitable for the vaccine. Having all of that and taking all of that into account, can you require employees to be vaccinated against COVID um, as an employer? So as we know, there's currently no legal requirement that says that employees have to be vaccinated. So in the absence of it being a legal requirement, you cannot force an employee to be vaccinated without their consent. Now, initially, ACAS, if you recall back, um, I think it was in February time, suggested that it may be necessary to make vaccinations mandatory where it's necessary for the job to be carried out. And in fact, they issued some wording on their website um, early February in relation to that, which was subsequently withdrawn on the 25th of February. Vaccination without consent could amount to a criminal offence, uh, potentially assault and battery. Now that sounds very severe, but ultimately, if you're requiring those to have uh, a vaccine without their consent, then that's what the legal position would be. An employer could decide to prevent unvaccinated employees from entering the workplace or restrict their duties. But clearly vaccination is a more significant issue for employers in high risk sectors, such as the care sector where employees will be working with vulnerable individuals. So the Department of Health and Social Care commenced a five week consultation on the 14th of April uh, into mandatory vaccination for nursing and care home workers. If a company is considering imposing a mandatory vaccination requirement or treating employees or job, job applicants differently because of their vaccination status, then there's a number of relevant issues that you need to think about. Firstly, that one that we've just been talking about, which is that vaccination is not suitable for everyone. Requiring an employee to be vaccinated without their consent as a condition to providing work could amount to a repudiatory breach of contract. And we know that where there's a repudiatory breach of contract, that can result in a constructive dismissal claim. Potential reasons where a mandatory requirement to be vaccinated could be indirectly discriminatory against certain protected characteristics. And we'll look at that um, a bit further into the presentation. We know that private vaccination is not uh, possible or available. So employees have to wait their turn to be offered the vaccine. Only allowing vaccinated employees to return to work, therefore, could potentially lead to indirect or direct age discrimination claims against younger employees. A vaccination requirement may be difficult to justify on health and safety grounds, and you'd think that's the one that really you would be looking to rely on in, in trying to get your, your workforce effectively back into the workplace. Um, I think we've seen this morning, haven't we, um, the BBC News uh, providing information about transmission and where, of course, there is more statistics that show that transmission is reduced where the vaccine is administered then the, 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 the greater opportunity you have to argue that you're providing a health, uh, a safe environment for your uh, workers where those workers are having vaccines. 
It's uncertain as to how long the protection from the vaccination will last, so con consideration has to be given to that. Um, imposing a mandatory vaccination uh, requirement could result in obviously negative publicity for the company. And there is a small risk, of course, that the vaccination can have long term adverse effects. We've all seen uh, the information that's been um, uh, published about the risks around certainly the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine. And we're not certain, are we, about where we are in that respect. So forcing an employee as part of your vaccine requirement to have um, a vaccine could resent, result in a claim of personal injury if there's any damage uh, to the health of the individual as a result. So obviously you'd need to consider consultation with workplace and health and safety representatives in your trade unions. And of course, there'll be data protection implications in requiring employees to provide information on their vaccination status, verifying its accuracy and, of course, retaining the data. And just so you know, as a business, certainly MFG, we are asking our staff to advise us if they have had the vaccine. So from a data protection point of view, that's sensitive information. And we are collating that and holding that on behalf of individuals. So what are the alternatives to mandatory vaccinations? We've identified that there may be some sectors where it may be possible to include mandatory vaccination and the risks associated with that. But as an alternative, you could introduce a voluntary vaccination requirement. So this would need to be introduced with collective consultation with employees of trade union uh, reps, um, depending on the numbers, obviously. If you're a smaller employee, you wouldn't have to give uh, consideration to that, but you would need to consult. Um, you need to consider an internal communications plan that deals with the potential advantages and disadvantages of vaccination so that employees are fully informed and can make their own decisions. This would comply with your implied duty to take reasonable care of the health and safety of your employees and reasonable steps to provide a safe workplace and system of work. Both of those are implied duties implied into the contract and are obligations that you owe to your staff. So alternative measures could include regular testing for frontline staff and regular health and safety reviews to ensure the employer is up to date with, uh, with properly implementing COVID secure guidelines. Um, you may also wish to consider allowing an employee to work from home or continue to work from home or temporarily change their job or responsibilities to minimise the workplace risk as far as possible. So what are the potential discrimination issues? Indirect discrimination we, uh, we touched on uh, previously. The requirement for employees or job applicants to be vaccinated is likely to amount to a provision criterion or practice, a PCP. Uh, and if that puts individuals with a protected characteristic at a particular disadvantage compared to others, then there could be a breach of the Equality Act 2010. So a vaccination requirement could put employees of a certain age group, disability, pregnancy or maternity, sex, religion or belief at a particular disadvantage. So from an age point of view, Older individuals are currently being prioritised for vaccination. As private vaccine is not available, this could be discriminatory towards younger age groups. Disability, some of the vaccines in production are not suitable for certain individuals. An employee with certain allergies may also be advised not to have the vaccine because of anaphylaxis. Other employees may refuse the vaccine for mental health reasons or due to phobia of needles. Pregnancy or maternity, the current advice, of course, is that pregnant or breastfeeding women should not be vaccinated. An indirect sex discrimination claim could be brought where a woman is disadvantaged by her employer's vaccination policy. From a sex point of view, we know as well uh, that individuals may wish to delay vaccination if they're trying to conceive, because again, that's been advised by the government. That could result in a sex discrimination case if they're disadvantaged as a result of your policy. Uh, from a race point of view, Vaccine take up in previous national uh, programs has been low in areas with high proportions of ethnic minorities. Minority ethnic groups were more likely to, uh, more likely to be hesitant to accept the vaccine because of low confidence in the vaccine. Uh, relig religion or belief, it's possible that certain religious or moral objections could be protected under the protected characteristics of religious or philosophical belief. If you remember, we've had things like veganism recently being accepted as being a uh, philosophical or, or religious belief. Other employees may have a strongly held belief that vaccines are harmful to public health. That may amount or be sufficient to amount to a belief for the purposes of the Equality Act. Even where an employer does not make vaccination mandatory, it should ensure the workplace policies do not indirectly discriminate against employees who are not vaccinated. So could a mandatory vaccination be justified as a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim? You may be able to justify a vaccination policy that may be discriminatory against a particular protected characteristic if you can show that the policy can be objectively justified and is a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. The burden is on you to show the justification. 
And as is generally the case with indirect discrimination, establishing the legitimate aim is likely to be the easier part of the test. In this situation, you'd rely on the need to protect the health and safety of staff, clients, etc. You must be able to show that uh, your actions actually contribute, contribute to the pursuit of a legitimate aim. Um, and as we've seen today with the BBC News uh, update that uh, vaccine transmission can be reduced by up to a half, um, it'll be difficult for an employer to be criticised, I think, uh, for trying to achieve a reduction in transmission in the workplace by encouraging a vaccine programme. To establish that a vaccination policy was a proportionate means of achieving a, leg a legitimate aim, an employer must demonstrate that the measures taken are reasonably necessary in order to meet that aim, but will not need to show that it had no alternative cause of action. Proportionality may be a more difficult hurdle for you to uh, get over. Compliance with COVID secure guidelines and introducing regular testing could be seen as a more effective and less discriminatory means of achieving the health and safety legitimate aim that you need to have. It's also possible that employers' actions in requiring a particular employee to be vaccinated could be directly discriminatory. And remember, there's no justification for direct discrimination. Can you ask whether a candidate has been vaccinated as part of the recruitment process? I think this will probably be helpful for Hewitt recruitment as well, because it may well be they're uh, receiving these types of questions. It's unclear whether asking a candidate their vaccination status could be a prohibited health question. So we know in the recruitment process that you shouldn't be asking health questions uh, before the stage of making an offer, unless, of course, it's a requirement for the role. So section 60 of the Equality Act states that other than in the circumstances set out in section 66, person A to whom an application for work is made but not, must not ask about the health of the applicant B either before offering work to B or where A is not in a position to offer work to B before including B in a pool of applicants from whom A intends to select a person to offer work. Section 60 defines offering work as making a conditional or unconditional offer of work. Therefore, job offers can be made conditional on satisfactory responses to pre-employment disability or health inquiries or satisfactory health checks. Employers must not discriminate against job applicants in response to the results of such inquiries or checks. Uh, section 60 does not define detail of what a question about the health of the application might, uh, applicant might include. It's possible that a question concerning a job applicant's vaccination status could be unlawful unless it falls within one of the limited circumstances in which a health question can be asked. And of course, those relate to the candidate's ability to carry out a function that's intrinsic to the job and reasonable adjustments needed for the job itself. Clearly, in my view, any such questions, if you did need to ask that question, should not be posed until after the offer has been made. So does, do you have the, um, does an employer have a health and safety obligation to ensure employees are vaccinated? Employers have health and safety duties to employees and those that come into contact with your employees to minimise the risk of exposure to COVID. The nature of some workplaces, such as frontline healthcare or care homes for the elderly, may mean that vaccination as a precondition of working some roles could potentially be justified on health and safety grounds. However, consideration will need to be given to whether vaccinations are a proportionate way to address the risk. You'd first need to undertake a detailed risk assessment to evidence uh, why COVID-19 vaccination was required in addition to compliance with COVID secure guidelines in place and consult with employees or workplace um, reps uh, or trade unions. This would still need to be reviewed as it may be difficult to justify that an employee must have the vaccination if the residents, for example, have been vaccinated themselves. So should you require employees to sign a vaccination waiver? Owing to the potential risk of a claim from a worker the contracts, uh, who contracts COVID-19 in the workplace, it has been suggested that workers who refuse the vaccine could be required to sign a waiver indicating they understand the medical risks of their decision as a condition of being permitted to continue to enter the workplace. The waiver, of course, would only be valid and not deemed ineffective if the employer is actually complying with COVID safe guidelines in the workplace. In practice, it'll be difficult for a worker to establish the employer was liable if they are following COVID secure measures. Furthermore, it'll be difficult to establish liability as many people may be in the workplace who are asymptomatic, as we know, and therefore not tested. One other point is whether or not you require a waiver to be signed in the event that there's an adverse reaction to any vaccine if, it, if you do have it as a mandatory requirement. Does an employer have a health and safety obligation to provide privately obtained vaccines? No, they're not, and they're not currently available. Can an employer make an offer of employment conditional on an employee evidencing that they've been vaccinated? Potentially, yes, 
but until the vaccination program program has been rolled out in full this is likely to cause practical issues as many candidates will not yet have been offered the opportunity to be vaccinated if they're in a younger age group can an employer prevent unvaccinated employees from entering the workplace it would not be practical practical for most employers to prevent unvaccinated staff from entering the workplace as the majority of the population have still not yet been offered vaccination and most people have been attending work if they're not displaying symptoms anyway careful consideration would need to be given before deciding that it'd be appropriate to prevent unvaccinated staff from entering the workplace if people are able to work from home then that will obviously resolve the issue the position in relation to frontline healthcare workers and other sectors with close contact with the vulnerable may be different can an employer discipline an employee who refuses to have a COVID-19 vaccine? An employer could argue that a request to be vaccinated amounts to a reasonable management instruction on the basis that it's an instruction intended to protect health and safety. Failure to follow that reasonable instruction can lead to disciplinary processes and dismissal. Whether a requirement to be vaccinated is a reasonable management instruction will depend on the facts of the case. For example, the nature of the role and the number of clinically vulnerable colleagues in the workplace. Employers in the care or health sector may potentially be able to issue a reasonable instruction to employees to be vaccinated because refusal could put vulnerable uh, patients at risk. Employees in other sectors are likely to find this a weak argument. If an employee's refusal to be vaccinated is deemed to be unreasonable, then it may be that disciplinary action could be justified. Can an employee dismiss an employee who refuses to be uh, vaccinated? Obviously, if they have less than two years service, then the risk of doing so is reduced if you do dismiss um, the, the risks of a claim that are reduced but be aware of course of the potential discrimination issues and they are day one rights uh, for employees they don't need to have two years service uh, those that are workers or self-employed there should be less risk of a claim if you if it's a requirement for them to come into your business um, obviously to fairly dismiss the employee you need to be able to potentially rely on one of the five fair reasons and it's going to be difficult for you to do so uh, in these in these circumstances are employees entitled to be paid time off to be vaccinated? There's no legal requirement for you to pay uh, employees if they take time off for a vaccination appointment, but it's likely you'd want to support them to do so and you may well agree therefore to pay them. What are employees entitled to be paid if they suffer side effects from the vaccine and are unfit to come to work? In the majority of cases, employees should not need to take time uh, off from work following the vaccination. Um, the, the, if they do so, it should be short term. Your usual sick pay policy and entitlement should apply in that situation. What is an employee entitled to be paid if they refuse to be vaccinated? Employees who are able to work remotely should be paid as normal. If an employee is unable to work remotely, the issue of pay is problematic. The employee will argue that they are willing and able to work and that they should be paid in full. However, the employer will state that they cannot work for health and safety reasons. Statutory sick pay will not be available as the employee is clearly fit for work. It could be possible for the employee to be furloughed, but in the, in the absence of a specific contractual provision, I don't believe that an employee and could successfully argue that they've been suspended on medical grounds. If an employee is unable to be vaccinated or refuses vaccination on the grounds of, for example, religious belief, uh, there is authority to suggest uh, that the in employee's inability to work is due to unavoidable impediment and the employer should continue to pay them. Can an employer withhold sick pay from an employee who contracts COVID-19 after refusing to be vaccinated? I don't believe that an employee could withhold either statutory or contractual sick pay in those circumstances. Do vaccinated employees still have to follow social distancing guidelines? Government guidance is that everyone, including vaccinated employees, must continue to follow social distancing guidance and wear a face mask and wash their hands thoroughly and frequently. Vaccinated employees should also be advised to follow the current advice on testing and self-isolation. Introducing a contractual requirement. Any contractual change would require the existing employees uh, to satisfy the usual cons considerations with respect to changing contractual terms. Without consent, the employer will be faced with unilaterally imposing the change or terminating um, an employee's uh, employment and offering re-engagement. Both of these carry risks and could be deemed controversial in the current climate. Introducing a contractual requirement for new employees to be vaccinated will potentially be easier, so this is for new employees, but will do little to secure widespread protection within the workforce as most employers anticipate low levels of recruitment for the foreseeable future. That's depending, of course, on what Laura's just said. Implementing a vaccine policy, an alternative to introducing a contractual requirement would be to introduce a policy. Uh, which would encourage all employees to be vaccinated where possible, but accepting that there'll be circumstances in which it's not possible or appropriate. 
clearly absence of a contractual requirement may make it more difficult to fairly and reasonably discipline or dismiss employees based on the policy. Um, if you would like to implement a vaccination policy, you should consider the following. Consulting with staff or trade unions, consider how you intend to communicate with staff about the policy, consider the data protection obligations in relation to processing data and how you're going to communicate that to staff, determine how the policy can be used to reduce the risk of workplace conflict between vaccinated and unvaccinated staff, and in what circumstances would the policy need to be reviewed. The policy should address the following purpose and benefits of a vaccination, scope of coverage, so the policy should confirm which roles and workplace locations will be encouraged to be vaccinated and why, whether the policy should extend to all who come into the workplace, including contractors and visitors, the policy should confirm whether employees will be given paid time off to attend appointments and deal with data protection and privacy. Can employers ask employees if they've been vaccinated and keep a record? Employers may want proof of vaccination in order to be able to track levels of vaccination, Proof of vaccination could also be required for eligibility under any uh, vaccination incentive schemes. We've still no decision from the government about COVID status certification, but health information, of course, falls into the special category for data protection. Uh, and therefore you'll need to have a lawful basis for processing that personal data, which could include your legitimate interest as an employer. And of course you can, you can have the employee's consent. The ICO advises that an employer could rely on the employment condition or health condition under Article 9 for processing this data. How long should you retain um, employees' vaccination data? You'll need to regularly review whether they, you still have grounds for the collection and retention of the data, particularly as the vaccination rollout progresses. Do employees have the right to be notified if a colleague refuses to be vaccinated? There is no problem you, in you advising that individuals in the workplace are not vaccinated, but you cannot, of course, disclose their names because that would be a breach of GDPR. And that covers everything that I wanted to whistle stop tour through on vaccinations. I know it's a lot, but don't worry, the full um, presentation will be sent to you after. Um, and then, of course, um, we can deal with any questions now. And as I normally do, um, if there are any questions that you want to send to me separately, I'll deal with them outside of today's um, forum and I can respond to you um, separately. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sally. That was very comprehensive and I think that's probably got a lot of people uh, thinking about their plans and uh, how they're going to make the next steps with regards to uh, COVID and the workplace. So that, fascinating. I think your, your presentation will be one of the most eagerly awaited documents that we will all receive at some stage today or early tomorrow. So. Uh, and we'll be thumbed through at length. I'm going to go to I'll do questions at the end, folks, because I'm very keen for us to uh, to hear from our second speaker today. And uh, I, there aren't any in the chat, so that way we can just save questions to the end. Now, um, we are dealing obviously with uh, employees and with colleagues uh, across the workforce and across all age groups. And I uh, do a lot of work um, with Judy Tabwick with regards to young people and skills. But equally, the Chamber of Commerce have recently been supporting the scheme which Judy is going to talk to us about this morning. So I'm going to hand you over to Judy Chadwick, who is Director of Skills at the Worcestershire Local Enterprise Partnership and a big partner of the Chamber of Commerce. So over to you, Judy. Thank you, Rob. Um, that was a very uh, just or every time I ever hear uh, an HR professional speak, I always think to myself, oh, it's very complicated, isn't it? Very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm here today to talk to you about um, something entitled the Midlife MOT. Um, so a little bit controversial, possibly age discriminatory. Um, I'm sure Sally can advise on that. But um, because it's a government product, that means it, it, you know, it's over and above all of these things. So I'm going to try and share my screen. This may well not go well, but let's hope that it does. Can you see that? I'm just doing, I have to manage my screens. So you've disappeared. Oh. Yep, yeah, we, can, we can see that now. Yeah. Ah, amazing, fantastic. So um, how has this come about, the midlife MOT? So um, the background is that, um, as you all know, and I'm sure many of you um, will have heard me talk about or will have heard Gary talk about uh, the fact that in Worcestershire, um, the demographic is that one in three people in the workforce from 2019 is over 50. 
Um, you all know, I'm sure that the Local Enterprise Partnership um, has focused over the last few years around um, moving young people into the workforce. So the products of Worcestershire apprenticeships, the work that we've done um, within the schools has all been kind of focused on how do we support our employers around succession? And the Midlife MOT was an opportunity that was presented to us kind of um, over Christmas uh, from DWP. And we were able to kind of take what had been run nationally and look to localise it. So the Midlife MOT was run uh, nationally. It was tested by some very large employers. Um, I'm going to say Aviva was one of them because that's the one that certainly pops into my mind. Um, but it was tested with some large employers who utilised the Midlife MOT to support their workforce um, as individuals, but it gave some really useful information to them. So for me, you know, it very much raises the importance, the whole conversation about workforce planning, about succession, about young people coming into workforces. Um, and it very much, uh, for me as well, also supports the needs um, that the, the LEP recognises that we need to support you as employers to be able to succession plan into your businesses, but also to be able to upskill and reskill. Um, so it very much supports the the, the your demand for skills so Laura talked earlier about you know this the skill shortage as uh, she mentioned it and um, you know we need to understand what that means um, so uh, we will always have an idea of the key themes but we need to know the detail underneath that and what we also need to do um, is create the demand um, we quite often talk about demand from employers and what we mean when we talk about that is generally entrance whether that's um, a young person coming in or whether that's um, a, a person coming out of another employment opportunity into your workforce. Um, but also when I talk about demand, quite often what I mean is demand of young people to study the subjects that actually you will need within your businesses in the future. Because if we don't influence those young people to understand what those subjects are, they're going to keep picking the things that they traditionally understand, which, as we all know, is not necessarily the things that we as businesses require moving forward. So just at this point, I want to uh, talk to you quickly about the local skills report. So at the beginning of April, the Local Enterprise Partnership published its local skills report. It's a high level prioritisation of where the Local Enterprise Partnership and its partners including the chamber are kind of what are our priorities what are we focused on what are we uh, what is um our drive over the next five years uh, in terms of skills and employment um i will make sure that the um link is in the chat i, th I think it's on the end of this presentation um but it is it is a 28 page document so you may not want to read it all um, but there is a, a summarized version coming soon um, but um, it does give you a really good insight into uh, the sort of demographics and all the data behind Worcestershire. And you can see quite clearly why we're trying to head in the direction we are. Um, so with all that in mind, I'm going to introduce you to you, the Midlife MOT. Now, the Midlife MOT um, typically aimed at people over 50. Um, that, that's who it's aimed at. It's aimed typically at individuals, um, but the information that the that the process produces once the individual understands that is really useful for you as employers so it's about how we as employers are able to kind of harness that information that individuals understand um, the midlife mot was created by the local enterprise partnership with its partner the worcestershire county council uh, but also working with Public Health England, Worcestershire Burst, the Worcestershire element of that, uh, the National Career Service and the Money and Pension Service. So, um, I think, you know, for me, certainly what the Midlife MIT, one of the things that this, this, all of the information that we understand or that we could understand individually about ourselves um, would have been really useful if we'd have had a little crystal ball prior to COVID and we'd have all been able to go through this process and know actually what some of this information might have meant for us. And um, so being able to understand our finances a bit better, being able to understand our well-being a bit better would have been really useful probably 12 months ago. Um, but in terms of this process, we are where we are. Um, and, and I think, you know, over the process of COVID, we as employers have all realised how important it is to 
support our staff and how we are all very much focused on that health and well-being support for employees. So in terms of how it can help you as a business, um, you know, sadly, um, the reality of the situation is, is that we do need we do need people to work for longer. And actually, the reality of the situation is that people are likely to work for longer. They can't afford um, to retire at the age of 65. Um, you know, and I'm sure Sally would be able to give some reference to this. But when they um, uh, changed the mandatory retirement age, the actual impact of doing that was about six months. So uh, as it stands, what, the, what that has done has meant that uh, when they've tracked that nationally, they've seen that women typically work for about six months longer and men typically seem to retire at the same point. Don't know why. Um, so there we are. Um, but yes, we need people to be productive whilst they're working for longer. So we need to make sure that they are um, able to understand what our needs are as an employer, able to consider um, any retraining opportunities. Um, you know, it reminds me of a conversation with one of my staff fairly recently who said to me, oh, social media, that's not my thing. No, but do you know, actually as an employer, I need that to be your thing because that's part of your role moving forward. That's part of what I need you to do as a project manager. So therefore, this is a skill you need to gain. Um, and actually, if you wanna keep in this kind of role, then I'm going to need you to think about that. So it, there is a little bit of a mindset change, I think, for some people who perhaps would have thought, oh, I don't need to do any more training. That's, you know, that's for younger people. That's not for me. Um, so this might support them to come to those own, those conclusions themselves. Um, it can support in terms of, you know, absenteeism, you know, if we're able as individuals, obviously I'm teaching you all to suck eggs really, but if we're able as individuals to identify health is issues earlier on, um, then hopefully we can prevent some of those, um, those things from happening. Um, so again, this could support us all in understanding that. Um, following our staff going through this process or us as employers supporting our staff to go through this process or to at least know this process is there, it should enable better conversations. So when you're having those conversations um, in your annual reviews about you know, where do you want to be in the business? What's your, where do you think you're gonna go? Um, we ask questions around, are you planning to retire? All of these things. Actually, people can say yes, no to that question, understanding the implications of that. It also helps us as businesses, if we're able to have those conversations, to think about what skills we will be losing out of our businesses that we rely on. Um, you know, we call them single points of success. I'm sure you've all got those individuals within your businesses who have that knowledge that we really need to get from them and we need to pass on to other people. And if we understand the timescales that we're looking likely to do that, then that, that's helpful for us in terms of our planning. So the midlife MOT typically covers three areas. So it covers health, uh, wealth, and career. So thinking about the first one of those, um, the first one is finance. So what the midlife MOT does, it's a website. What it does is it asks 10 questions. Um, it's going to be evolved over time. So at the moment, we're you know, quite happy with that, what it looks like. Um, but in terms of moving forward, we welcome any feedback to improve the, the information um, that, that's going through, through the system. The first one is about finance. Um, and it, you know, when we did um, some initial surveys around what did people want to understand, we went out and we asked about just over 650 residents of Worcestershire what they might want to understand about themselves at this point. Um, the biggest thing that surprised me um, was that people said, oh yeah, uh, do you know what? I understand my pension. I know I've got one, but uh, do I know where to find that information? Yeah, I probably know where to find the information, but do I know what that means, do I understand how much I've got in that pension? If I retired tomorrow, would I have enough money? And the answer predominantly was no, they didn't know that information. And that's vital information that they need to understand. Um, and if they knew that information, then we would be able to sort, uh, it would support our succession planning. Uh, the second area um, is around health and well-being. Um, so, you know, very much um, thinking about 
um, they themselves, their own situation, um, what preventative, and it is very much focused around preventative, what preventative support is available in the county that could support them. I think this is a really interesting area for you as employers, because again, if this highlights to individuals that they might have a need to consider, then actually it can support us as employers to think about our reward program or in our employee assistance programs and what we might be able to build into those, those common themes. Um, our employer has just launched um, a Slimming World program, for instance, um, and that is because um, when they were going through um, part of the consultation, uh, a lot of people said, you know what, I need to lose a little bit of weight. I need to get fitter. So a nice 12 week incentive, but actually as an employer, the fact that we've now, well, we've all enrolled, we haven't, but you know, lots of people have enrolled on the 12 week program will be very helpful um, to, to us as an employer. And the third section is around careers. So this is very much focused around the, what skills do I need to remain at the level I wish to remain at for the rest of my career? What might I need to understand? Actually, if I'm not likely to be working in this organization for one reason or another, what might I then need to consider um, to, to move to another employment opportunity? Um, so for us, certainly this is really helpful, I think as an employer to understand, you know, once they know that they need to work for another 10 years and then, um, you know, they've, they've made themselves or they're thinking about how they can make themselves fit and healthy, actually what retraining needs do they have? Um, so that's the basic premise of the Midlife MOT. Um, the Midlife MOT website um, is here at the bottom. It's very easy, uh, midlifemot.org. Um, as I say, it's launching today, so you are the first people to hear about this. Um, we'll probably be putting some media out, I would imagine, over the day. Um, but we have put together a couple of additional pieces. Now, I know that you're all HR professionals and you probably know this stuff really well. So you probably may not need this support. However, you will also know people that, um, you know, those people that ask you as HR professionals these questions all the time. Um, you know, I know a few people who work in HR and I can never resist asking them something that's been bugging me. So um, if workforce planning is something that they as a business really need to consider and they're not focused on whether it's a business owner or, you know, for you yourselves, we are planning on running three virtual workshops around workforce planning. On the website itself, there's an entire section. I had a great plan for this morning, which is that I'd, um, I'd um, asked Ben Mannion from Hewitt to do a fantastic introductory video. And I was going to use that because it was actually like half of my presentation done for me, but I couldn't get it to play. So clearly I need a little bit of retraining on digital. Um, but that's all on the website and there's a great section on there with hints and tips for workforce planning, some tools that um, employers can use. So please have a look at it. And as I said earlier, we really want any feedback. So if you look at it and say, well, yeah, Judy, but actually it could do with a bit of this or mm, that, like that, then, you know, please let me know. I'm absolutely open to that. And then the other thing that we um, are, want to offer you as employers is we're really keen to test this. So we've got some one-to-one -one sessions with a qualified advisor who will come out and who will work with a number of your staff and kind of go through the midlife MOT process with them, not online necessarily, but through a conversation. Um, so if this is something you would like to have happen in your workforce, um, then we are more than happy to come in and to do that for you. Um, so the website's at the bottom. Uh, please have a look at it. Please feedback. We, it, you know, it has to be useful to our employers or um, it won't be helpful. Um, and then here is the, um, I'm very proud of this 28 page document. So you're going to hear me talk about it quite a lot. Um, but um, here is the link to it if you want to have a read. Um, and at the bottom, I've put my web, um, my web, my email address. Um, so that if you are interested in either of our offers around workforce planning um, sessions and or um, the one-to-ones, then you can get in touch. I think what I'd also say at this point is it's really important for us to understand how we can support you. So actually, um, if there is anything that you have that's a skills issue that you just aren't getting anywhere with, then please do get in touch. Um, we're keen to support. Um, so my email address is there. 
Um, the other thing I just want to, I suppose, talk about at this point is part of the benefit of talking to us and or talking to the chamber um, in terms of your sort of skills needs is actually we can open up a number of the support schemes that are available in the county that would support some of the outcomes of the process, both the midlife MOT, but also general conversations. So we can come in and talk to you about bringing apprenticeships into your workforce, about traineeships, about kickstart placements. You know, as Rob mentioned earlier, the chamber and the county council are gateways for the kickstart process. So we'd be more than happy to come and talk to you about having a 16 to 24 year old in your workforce. You know, at the moment, as we all know, youth employment is high. Um, and this is a really great way of um, supporting those young people to get opportunities, some really great opportunities coming through on that scheme. And we'd welcome any more placements that we're able to bring forward. Um, but also retraining. So I noticed that Joe Sullivan is on this conversation and Joe is from Serco and Serco have the contract in the county to support our employers with retraining and upskilling um, and that's for small and medium enterprises is free of charge um, so uh, again that might be a link you want to make um, if you are larger than that we can have a conversation because sometimes there are things we can do so um, yes please get in touch we will um, certainly be able to open up any resources that we have for you but thank you for your time today I realise it was a lot less complex than Sally um, so I'm sure all your questions will be for Sally Thank you very much. Judy, thank you very much indeed. And um, thank you also for uh, highlighting the uh, relationship, obviously, between the LEP, uh, the Council and the Chamber and uh, a lot of the work that we do together there. And um, I think also what you've done is you've highlighted that uh, across our workforce, whether or not somebody may have literally just started their career or started a new role within your organisation, or maybe somebody's a lifer and they've been there for years and years and years, we still have a responsibility to uh, assess what those that person's needs are and see if we can actually help people with their uh, uh, with their futures. And um, that's that's key, I think, not only in your presentation, but obviously also in Sally's as well, because of the challenges that we're facing there. So um, you're getting a lot of very good comments in the chat saying how informative it is and how great it is. And but then some of those people have cleared off. But don't take that personally because they really enjoyed it. And as you can tell, there's now a delivery arriving at our house, which my son's going to deal with, hopefully. But are there any questions, folks? Any questions for our two speakers this morning? I can't see anything, which is, uh, which is unusual, but I think that's probably because... Um, Yeah, just a comment, comment there from Joe. So thank you, Joe, for that. And um, you've actually just linked in with me as well, which is fantastic. More comments there. So folks, I think that's probably it for questions because um, we are gonna send out some of the documents. And so you'll get those documents there. And uh, also, of course, yeah, as Judy quite rightly said, uh, social media is so important. So I'm sure many of you have taken some names down and you'll connect with people that are actually on that particular on the call today. So it leaves me to say a big thank you to Yaz because these events wouldn't happen if the Chamber Events team and particularly you, Yaz, got us all together. So thank you for that because these things don't just happen. Uh, Laura, thank you to you and to the continued support of Hewitt Recruitment with this fascinating and important forum. And we look forward to obviously to the next one. And of course to Sally and to Judy, because your contributions this morning have been fascinating. And I'm sure many people have used many reams of paper with their notes and they're looking forward to getting your presentations. So you've got five minutes folks to get the kettle on, ready for your next meeting at 11 o'clock. Uh, or you might just be preparing for Prime Minister's questions at 12 o'clock, because I think it's going to be a good one today. So uh, thank you very much for your support. Thank you for your attendance. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Take care. All the best.